Hey everybody, welcome to the Manalik. I'm John as always, and it's time for another day of playing around with pirates and dinosaurs and vampires and merfolk. Many more merfolk. We haven't seen any yet, but today we're going to see a bunch because we're going to go over every single card in blue. Of course, a couple quick disclaimers. This is a limited set review. I'm talking about draft and sealed only. If I say a card is bad, doesn't mean that it's not amazing in Legacy or Canadian Highlander or something. Just means it's bad in limited. Disclaimer number two. These are my first impressions. I have not played with these cards, so my ratings will, of course, change over time. But this is how I am going to approach pre-release. This is how I'm going to approach my first few drafts in a couple of weeks, etc. Finally, of course, these are my opinions. These are how I rate the cards. I'm not telling you the gospel truth of what a card is rated, and you better listen to me. I do these set reviews to encourage discussion, discussion with me, discussion amongst yourselves. Make use of those comments down below. But let's get started. Up first in blue, we have Air Elemental. Air Elemental is three blue blue for a creature elemental at uncommon. It's a flyer and it's a 4-4. Four four. Uh, you want a reprint from Alpha? Well, here's a reprint from Alpha. This, of course, has been reprinted a whole bunch of times, but we haven't really seen it since M10. There was a time where Air Elemental was just one of the best limited cards around. It's still quite good. In fact, we just talked about how I was wrong about Ominous Sphinx not being super solid just because a 5-mana 4-4 four four is solid. Well, here you go. Here is Air Elemental. This card isn't broken. It's not a snap first pick, but you'll probably always play it and it will do some serious work. Solid B for good old Air Elemental. Arcane Adaptation is up next. Arcane Adaptation is two and a blue for an enchantment at rare. As Arcane Adaptation enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures you control are the chosen type in addition to their other types. The same is true for creature spells you control and creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield, so in your deck, in the graveyard, etc. This could do some cool things that, uh, you know, could be done here with the various tribes, though I feel like in general you're just not going to have everything. You're going to require multiple rares to really come together to really get some benefit here. For example, the uh, this plus the vampire lord uh, plus playing a number of non-vampire creatures that are now vampires would work. Uh, but really, I think this is much more for the EDH jank constructed crowd. In limited, I'm going to likely start with passing this very regularly until I see some consistent possibilities. The jank is there, but I don't really rate jank highly in limited. So D plus for arcane adaptation. Cancel is back yet again for who knows how many times now. One blue blue for an instant at common counter target spell. Play it in sealed just because people will play bigger, slower threats in sealed and you have less card choice in general anyways. In draft, cancel is relegated to the sideboard and often doesn't even come in. One blue blue is just too rough for a counter spell generally unless it does something more. Sideboard D. Up next is Chart a Course. Chart a Course is one in a blue for a sorcery at uncommon. Draw two cards, then discard a card unless you attacked with a creature this turn. This seems pretty solid to me. Getting Divination for cheaper and maybe having to discard a card is totally fine. Then if you're able to attack, say maybe with a flyer as blue is often want to do, not even having to discard? I like this a fair bit and seeing a card draw spell potentially being very playable makes me so excited about this format. You are going to get sick and tired of me talking about how excited I am about this format. Still, this is a mid-pack fodder at best, but mid-pack that I think you'll always play. So I'm going to go with a C plus on chart, of course. Up next is Daring Saboteur. Daring Saboteur is one in a blue and looks a lot like Jace, but I don't think that's supposed to be Jace. Uh, creature Human Pirate at rare. It's a 2-1. Pay two and a blue, Daring Saboteur can't be blocked this turn. Whenever Daring Saboteur deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. This is just beautiful. It's a piker that loots when it hits, and it's a mana sink for you later turns when you just have excess mana. Just absolutely beautiful and exactly what I like to see in limited formats. It's a really high pick for me, often a first pick. It's not a bomb. It's not a bomb at all. It's just one of these cards that is super, super high value for you. Uh, easy B for me. Uh, really excited to play Daring Saboteur. Up next is Deadeye Quartermaster. Deadeye Quartermaster is three and a blue for a creature human pirated on common. She's a 2-2. When Deadeye Quartermaster enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment or vehicle card. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. 
I'm just not sold on this. We just don't get equipment that's worthwhile these days, and the vehicles, thankfully, are really underpowered, as we'll see next week. Uh, really, it, it's going to come down to do you have the good vehicles? There's like a couple that I might be happy to go and get with this. If you do, it becomes playable, but unfortunately, they're rare. And uh, if you don't have them, this is just a four mana 2-2. Two -two. I'm going to pick this very late, and, and I'm probably just never going to play it. D plus, just no, not for me. Deep Root Waters is up next. Deep Root Waters is two and a blue for an enchantment and uncommon. Whenever you cast a merfolk spell, create a 1-1 one, one blue merfolk creature token with hexproof. Well, here's your goblin slide card of the format that people will fall over themselves to build around. It'll definitely be fun. And getting an army of 1-1 one, one merfolk and having merfolk synergies going around will definitely be cool. Uh, but... Be well aware that this is a once in several, if not dozens of drafts kind of thing to go off. If you really try to go in on this too often, you're just going to lose drafts left and right. I'll let far braver drafters tackle this long before I do. Uh, I'll put this at like a build around D+. This just isn't a card that I'm looking to play. I know some of you out there will love it, and I encourage you to try it, and let me know how it goes, because I'm not going to be the one to try it. Depths of Desire is up next. Depths of Desire is two and a blue for an instant at common. Return target creature to its owner's hand. Create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. We're going to see this a whole bunch. This is another of the mechanics, these treasure artifact tokens. Basically, all kinds of creatures and spells and triggered abilities and etc. will give you a token that you can tap, sack it, and cash it in for a mana of any kind. Plus, there's some treasure synergies that we'll see later as well. Uh, from now on, I will not be repeating the entire phrase. I will simply say it makes a treasure token. Anyways, this is uh, three mana for a bounce spell, which is all right. I'd prefer to play two, and I really prefer to pay one. But getting a potentially relevant or at least rampy treasure is a very solid addition for that extra mana or two that you're paying. It's not a super high pick, but I will play these far more than is justified. Uh, I've got a C plus on this. I'm always happy to play bounce spells, even at three mana. I love them. I love them a lot. And this set, this set looks real friendly to bounce spells, just the way I like to play. So C plus for me for Depths of Desire, probably a little bit over biased there, but I love it. I love it. Up next is Dive Down. Dive Down is a single blue mana for an instant at common. Target creature you control gets plus two, zero plus three and gains hexproof until end of turn. It's a fine enough combat trick. It'll save your creature from nearly anything, be it combat damage or removal or whatever, all for a single mana. And unlike an indestructible trick, this stops exile and bounce and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I'd never feel bad about including this, but I'd also never go out of my way to include it or pick it. It's a very late, late pack pick and just kind of a C. Don't go out of your way for this, but if you have it and you've got a spot, you're not going to feel bad about it. Up next is Dreamcaller Siren. Dreamcaller Siren is two blue blue for a creature Siren Pirate at rare. It's a 3-3 with flash, flying. It can only block creatures with flying. And when Dreamcaller Siren enters the battlefield, if you control another pirate, tap up to two target non-land permanents. Seems solid. 3-3 three, three Flash Flyer that can only block flyers for four is pretty fine and playable. If you get the pirate trigger, getting to tempo out an opponent is even better. This is just a solid kind of mid-tier rare. You'd probably skip it for really, really good premium removal. But otherwise, take it, always play it, and be pretty happy about it. The slight downside of not being able to block stuff on the ground is a downside for sure, but it's nowhere near enough to drop this any lower than a B. Uh, I'd be pretty happy with Dreamcaller Siren in every blue deck I ever play. Up next is Entrancing Melody. Entrancing Melody is X blue blue for a sorcery at on or sorry at rare. Gain control of target creature with converted mana cost X. Well, unfortunately, the things that you want to mind control are usually expensive. So you're not ever really going to get a discount on this from regular mind control unless you're taking something pretty piddly. Still, if you're hitting some five power bombs for seven mana, 
it's a fine deal. The upside of it not being an aura isn't really worth the increase in price though. Uh, you know, this is a little bit less weak to enchantment removal. It's still weak to bounce, uh, bounce, which as we'll see, and as we've seen exists in this set. I think this will really be format dependent, uh, so I'll keep an eye on it and start it at a B. You're really going to need to pay to get the most out of this, though. So it's going to need to be a slow format. You're going to need to have the mana. Hopefully with treasures and the slower format, though, this should just be a really good mind control. So I'm going to start at B. I could see it going all the way up to an A. A reprint from Avison Restored is up next. Favorable Winds, I believe we also saw it in Conspiracy 1? Maybe two. Favorable Winds is one and a blue for an enchantment at Uncommon. Creatures you control with flying get plus one, plus one. Uh, yeah, Favorable Winds is back, and I'd expect this to be about as good here as it has been previously, assuming you can get a critical mass of flyers. Getting fairly costed flyers to become unfairly costed is a really serious game. Even generally unplayable 1-1 one, one flyers for one, which we've already seen, and I believe we'll see some more, uh, become extremely playable when they're 2-2 two, two flyers for one. Until I have more experience with the format and find out how likely and how good the flyers deck is, I'm going to start pretty high on this and be ready to come down on it. So I'm going to start at a B- minus on it. Obviously, you need a lot of flyers to play it, but if you do, it should be a pretty solid play for you. Fleet Swallower is up next. Fleet Swallower is 5 blue blue for a creature fish. It's the first fish we've seen in uh, Ixalan, which is weird. It's a rare, it's a 6-6. Six, six. And when Fleet Swallower attacks, target player puts the top half of his or her library, rounded up, into his or her graveyard. So we've got a 6-6 six, six for 7. Without any additional evasion or anything super cool, I'm not really interested in that. I'd prefer it to be a 6-6 six, six for 6. We're getting 5-5s five, for 5 on the regular these days, so a 6-6 six, six for 7 just isn't quite there. Getting the top half of your opponent's library into their graveyard sounds big, but trust me, the diminishing returns on that is really, really, really low. You're just not going to mill out your opponent until you kill them with this. If you're reliably attacking in with a 6-6, six, six, you're just winning the game anyways. You don't need to pay seven mana for this. Not when we have five fives for five. Ultimately, this is just way too much of a trap and or just a win more card. So I'm going to start real low on this around a D plus, And I recommend that you pass this and don't play it. Let me know how it goes if you give it a try. But uh, it's not really, it's not really good in my eyes. Headwater Sentries are up next. Headwater Sentries are three and a blue for a creature merfolk warrior at common. There are two five. And that's all they are. There's no rules text. I really don't want to be playing this in most decks. If you're desperate to get to the end game, then this is your imitation of Ancient Grab. But you should cut this pretty readily in most, if not all, decks. So C- minus on this. The rare deck that might want to play it may play it, but I wouldn't recommend it in general. Herald of Secret Streams is up next. Herald of Secret Streams is 3 and a blue for a creature merfolk warrior at rare. It's 2-3. And creatures you control with plus one, plus one counters on them can't be blocked. There is somewhat of a plus one, plus one counters theme in this set. The merfolk are uh, primarily the ones doing it. But of course, the inclusion of explore adds some counters as well. So yeah, if you can really go off with merfolk counters, then this is going to end games really, really, really fast. Definitely a first pick build around that does go down in value the less and less that you're able to successfully build around it. The less explore you have, the less counters that you have, the less good this is going to be. But I could see this just being super grown testy where your opponent has this, they're placing counters down, and you just can't do anything unless you can find a way to kill this. Uh, so yeah, it seems like a fantastic first pick build around. I'm going to go with an A- minus on it. Um, B plus might be a little bit more appropriate just because you have to build around it. You could take this and just fail to get the cards that you need. So let's start this at a B plus. Up next is a big one. We've got Jace Cunning Castaway. Jace Cunning Castaway is one blue blue for a legendary Planeswalker Jace. Let's talk about that for a brief second. Planeswalker rules have changed. You can now have multiple Planeswalkers who are the same character as long as they have different names. It functions identically to legendary creatures now. That's probably never, ever going to come up in Limited. So it's not a big deal. Although it kind of has a, a, an impact in uh, Jace's ultimate here. Anyways, Jace is a mythic Planeswalker that starts with three loyalty. 
His plus one says whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player this turn, draw a card, then discard a card. So if you damage a player with combat damage, you get to loot once. Cool. Minus two, create a 2-2 blue illusion creature token with, when this creature becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it. So with Labyrinth Guardian and now this, it appears as though illusions have changed. Abilities don't kill them anymore. That kind of sucks in my mind. I think abilities being that strong against illusions was kind of cool. It allowed illusions to be a little bit more impactful, uh, despite being a little bit more fragile. Jace's ultimate, minus five, create two tokens that are copies of Jace Cunning Castaway, except they're not legendary. So you ultimate Jace, and you have two more Jaces that are not legendary, so they get to stick around, and they immediately get to use an ability. Very, very, very cool. Um, it's not a board warping Planeswalker to start. He does protect himself with a 2-2. Two -two. And if he's protected, you can hopefully start looting or at least building him up to split him in half. And if you do split him, being able to mix the abilities will be just great. Getting to, you know, make the two twos that you require and then being able to just plus one one of them so that you do get the loot trigger or maybe even multiple loot triggers if you plus one multiple them. And then if the copies start splitting themselves, things are just going to go insane. Uh, ultimately, I think he's a first pick because, just because he's a planeswalker, which will warp the board state. But I think he'll fall on the weaker side of the good planeswalkers. Think Semut, not Tybalt. <laughs> so I'm going to go with an A- minus on Jace Cunning, cunning Castaway. Uh, I, I think he looks just really fun, if not massively powerful, like some Planeswalkers we've seen. Up next is Copala, Warden of Waves. Copala, Warden of Waves is one blue-blue for a legendary creature, Merfolk Wizard at rare. They're a 2-2. Two -two. I believe it's a he? I think it's a he. Spells your opponent cast that target a merfolk you control cast two or more, cost two more to cast. Abilities your opponents activate that target a merfolk you control cost two more to activate. Uh, yeah, this is a fine role player in a merfolk deck, though I think it's just decidedly weaker than something like Herald of Secret Streams. Your opponents on average just don't have that much interactions with creatures in the usual limited format. And so this just isn't going to be as backbreaking as it'll be, like as in, you know, EDH or Constructed something where players have all kinds of removal and such. Ultimately, you'll have an overcosted 2-2 two -two that might force your opponent to wait a turn or two before killing a more dangerous merfolk than this one. I'd probably only look to pick this up once I'm down the merfolk path. I just don't think it's that great in limited. Obviously, in constructed, this is going to have significant uh, uh, build around possibilities. Uh, merfolk, uh, I don't know if this will be a thing in modern or not. Who knows? I'm not familiar enough with merfolk uh, in modern. But yeah, I've got this at a B minus at best for limited, despite its power in other formats. Lookout's Dispersal is up next. Lookout's Dispersal is two and a blue for an instant on common. Lookout's Dispersal costs one less to cast if you control a pirate. Counter target spell, unless its controller pays four mana. I liked Spell Shrivel in Battle for Zendikar, and I played it probably more than I should have. Getting Spell Shrivel, minus the Exile Clause, of course, for possibly one mana less if I'm playing pirates, which I probably am if I'm in blue... Uh, is something I'm very much interested in. This could be a key include in a good control deck that's been desperately missing from limited magic over the past 12 months or so. It's not great, by, by no means great, but I'll play it more than I probably should. For me, it's like a C+. Plus. For reality, it's probably like a C+. Navigator's Ruin is up next. Navigator's Ruin is two and a blue for an enchantment at Uncommon. It has Raid. Raid is back from Cons of Tarkir or Dragons of Tarkir, wherever it originally appeared. Raid is back. Raid is like in Rage, not a mechanic. It's just a reminder word to kind of group the same gameplay mechanic all under one thing. Uh, and that is, if you attacked this turn something happens. So, Raid. At the beginning of your end step, if you attacked with a creature this turn, target opponent puts the top four cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. I don't need to try mill cards for a good long while after I played around with Fraying Sanity several times. If you're reliably attacking every single turn, why aren't you just winning that way? Leave this for Constructed Jank, where even there it seems kind of bad. F-, minus. this is stone unplayable. It should be a last pick in every pack ever. Don't play this. Up next is One with the Wind. One with the Wind is one in a blue for an enchantment aura at common. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two, and has flying. Flying auras are usually pretty solid, a little bit more than they should be. This is a functional reprint of Spectral Flight from Innistrad, which was really quite solid. It's weak to removal and bounce, of course. 
but the cheapness of this and the power of it can just help end games quickly. Throwing this on like a dinosaur just ends the game. It's a bit more playable and uh, than a combat trick, though still not by too much. It's it's still a very weak C plus at best. It's probably just ever so cl slightly closer to a C than a C plus, but let's put one with the wind at a C plus for now. Up next is a reprint, uh, a reprint that some people are pretty excited for, not for limited, is Opt. Opt is a single blue mana for an instant at common. Scry one, draw a card. This is just, it's fine. It's in no way exciting. And I think it's pretty darn close to a 23 card level, maybe even 24th card. This is just likely far more intended to now be playable in modern for its include in things like Storm, uh, rather than being any way impactful on this limited format. Drawing cards is great, like really, really great. But I do feel like we're almost getting to a point where people are maybe even overrating card draw a little bit, which I never would have thought is possible because card draw is fantastic. But playing a card that literally just draws a card and scries one is not the way to win in many limited formats. I'm going to pick these very late pack and, and I probably just won't play them to start. Maybe if we get like a blue red spells matters deck in uh, the second half of this block or something. But for now, opt just isn't really on my radar. So C minus, I'm not going to play it to start with. Overflowing Insight is up next. Overflowing Insight is four blue, blue, blue for a sorcery at Mythic. Target player draws seven cards. Funny, but no. This is just a dead card for so, so long until so late in the game. And, and even then, you're spending an entire turn to draw those seven cards. Uh, and of course, some amount of them are just going to be lands... I'm just so totally out in this card for limited. I'll leave it to commander janky decks that'll try to cheat it out maybe, get it out a little bit early. I would want to be getting this thing at least three turns early for it to be in any way impactful in uh, in limited. And uh, I, I'm skipping this card. I'm going to actually put this card at an F for now. I just don't see reliably casting it enough for it to be good enough. I, I need to win the game for seven mana. I don't need to draw seven cards for seven mana. Up next is Perilous Voyage. Perilous Voyage is one in a blue for an instant at uncommon. Return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. If its converted mana cost was two or less, scry two. We have more bounce. I love bounce so much. I like this quite a bit. You won't always be using it on a two drop or lower, but disperse is 100% playable and good, which is what this card is, and it's a high personal pick for me. Those times that you would want to bounce your own creature, they exist, we've all done them for sure, and they've been the correct play, but they're not common enough to really downgrade this for not hitting a creature or something that you control. But those times that you can hit a two or less drop, and it makes sense to do so, getting to scry two attached to this is going to be a ton of value. It makes using this in an aggressive tempo deck a very wise choice. So you play a one drop creature, a two drop creature, a three drop creature, and then you bounce their two drop, and you scry two, and you find some more gas, and you get to attack in some more, and uh, you just tempo aggro them out. I'd pick this relatively highly about on the on summon level, kind of around a B minus. Up next is Pirate's Prize. Pirate's Prize is three and a blue for a sorcery at common. Draw two cards, create a colorless treasure artifact token. Four mana for a divination, but you do get a one mana rebate. That's all right. It's maybe playable if the format is quite slow. Even there, I probably still wouldn't go any higher than a C. Still, I'd really like to see this at the C level, as it'd probably be a format that I'd love if it was. And this format's really looking like a format that I'm going to love. So we're going to put this at C. I think you can probably generally play this and not feel bad about it. But I don't think you go out of your way to play it either. And if you have to cut it, you don't feel bad about that either. Up next is Prosperous Pirates. Prosperous Pirates is four and a blue for a creature human pirate at common. When Prosperous Pirates enters the battlefield, create two colorless treasure artifact tokens. So it's a three, four for five, which is a little bit pricey and not great. Probably a fine enough playable if you were just desperately requiring a creature or if you're doing something that requires treasure tokens or requires pirates. But as is, I think this is just a C. And even in even in those cases that you really want treasures or you really want pirates, this is probably still just like a strong C. You take it mid to late pack, you play it, you don't play it, you'd be happy in either scenario, I think. Up next is River Sneak. 
River Sneak is one and a blue for a creature Merfolk Warrior at Uncommon. It's a 1-1. One, one. River Sneak can't be blocked. Whenever another Merfolk enters the battlefield under your control, River Sneak gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Getting a temporary boost just isn't enough for me. I need to be playing well over 10 Merfolk in my deck. I would need this to basically be a 2-2 every turn for me to be happy playing a 2-mana 1-1 one, one that can't be blocked. I just don't think that's going to happen. It feels like a trap for me that a lot of people will value way too highly, like Slitherblade. I'll start at a D-plus on this, and I expect people to yell at me about it, but I'm at a D-plus on this. I'm just not playing this card. So D-plus for River Sneak. Up next is River's Rebuke. River's Rebuke is for blue blue for a sorcery at rare. Return all non-land permanents target player controls to their owner's hand. This could potentially be backbreaking. Clearing the board for an attack is a huge thing, especially if your opponent is unable to replay everything every uh, next turn. Then you might actually get two really good attacks out of it. That being said, it's not exactly removal, nor a bomb, so it's not the highest of picks. But I'd still probably feel pretty darn good taking this pick three maybe even pick two. Uh, higher in later packs for sure if I'm blue. First pick for sure in pack three if I'm blue and going to be looking slightly at the late game. And yeah, this, this just looks great. As is, it's likely around a B. Don't push this into your aggro decks. As good as it would be to, you know, play a whole bunch of creatures and then play this, your aggro decks probably don't have a great plan of getting to six mana and still having a great board state. So be careful there. Uh, but this looks great. I've got this at a B. Uh, River's Rebuke is just gonna, <laughs> it's gonna feel real bad to get hit with this now and then, but it's such a good card. Up next is Runaround. Runaround is three and a blue for an instant at common. Put target artifact or creature on top of its owner's library. More bounce. This one is literally just the card Griptide with uh, the addition of hitting an artifact for free. Uh, this is just great. Hitting something to the top of your opponent's deck is a real killer. Taking away their draw step, forcing them to replay it, uh, all at instant speed is really, really backbreaking. I love, love Griptide. I love sets that have Griptide or Griptide-like effects. Uh, this will be always included in all my blue decks, be they controlling or tempo aggro or whatever. Solid B- minus from me with maybe a slight bias there, but I don't think so. Griptide is just a really good card. Up next is Sailor of Means. Sailor of Means is two and a blue for a creature human pirate at common. He's a 1-4. And when Sailor of Means enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. This is just 100% okay. It's not great. It's not horrible. It'll help you get a little bit later in the game, both by blocking as well as that one-time ramp. It's not something I'd ever go out of my way to get, and it's not something I would actively avoid playing either. It's just a middle-of-the-road C that... Goes up ever so slightly if your plan is to go late, late game or to get treasure synergy or I guess if you really desperately need to pirate, here you go. If you're planning on being aggressive, you probably don't want to touch this. Probably much more playable in seal just because you don't have the uh, creature selection that you would like, but just a general middle of the road C. Up next is our flip card for blue. It is Search for Azkanta. Search for Azkanta is one and a blue for a legendary enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may put it into your graveyard. Then, if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, you may transform Search for Azkanta. It becomes Azkanta, the Sunken Ruin. Azkanta, the Sunken Ruin, is a legendary land that you can tap to add blue to your mana pool, or you can pay two blue and tap it to look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a non-creature, non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. It's kind of like Impulse, but as we often talk about in Limited, you're just not going to have too, too many non-creatures cards in your deck, so you may very well hit nothing with this, and what you hit may not even be that great. But back to the enchantment side, I like the enchantment side, even if it's a, a, a little bit grindy. Getting card selection like that is really nice and probably worth a card and two mana. Once this flips to Azkanta, though, I'm just not sold on it. Uh, you're just not going to hit enough off of Azkanta for this to be really worthwhile. Could have a decent place in like a blue-red spells style deck, but on average, I want to play this for the search for Azkanta. I don't really want to find Azkanta. Uh, so I'm going to put this at B-. Hopefully it, it just does some serious work, and then I guess you have the option when Azkanta flips. But I would prefer this if it just never flipped. So B- minus for it. it. It comes down because of the eventual flip and the eventual turning off of it. Uh, obviously has various constructed implications for sure. But in limited, 
You want the enchantment side, not the land. Up next is Shaper Apprentice. Shaper Apprentice is one and a blue for a creature merfolk wizard at common. She's a 2-1. Shaper Apprentice has flying as long as you control another merfolk. A piker is fine, which is a 2-1 for 2. It's around a C- minus to maybe a C. You can, you can play it if you need a creature, but you're not going to go to your way for it. And if it gets flying, it's better for sure. If you're at well over six merfolk or so, this becomes kind of a C+. Plus. Unfortunately, 2-1 flyers for two are great because they come down on turn two and attack on turn three. This can come down on turn two, but without a ton of merfolk in your deck, you're just not reliably going to get to attack in the air on turn three. So C plus is kind of my ceiling, and that's if you have, you know, six-ish merfolk. If your deck is 100% merfolk, then yeah, this gets better for sure. Again, assuming you have that three-drop merfolk to turn this online, or I guess another two-drop or even a one-drop. But yeah, this is this is just kind of probably averages out to a C. If you are heavy merfolk, it gets up to a C plus, And if you are light on merfolk, it drops down to a C minus. Up next is Shipwreck Looter. Shipwreck Looter is one and a blue for a creature human pirate at common. She's a 2-1. She has raid. When Shipwreck Looter enters the battlefield, if you attack with a creature this turn, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. I'm not sure how I feel about a creature actually being called Looter, but only getting to loot once. Feels bad. Anyways, it's a piker that you want to probably come down on later than turn two because you want to have attacked. But then you're left with a 2-1 on turn three or four or five or whatever and that's not great any later than turn three and this just feels really mediocre i'll start it at a c i won't feel horrible playing at it but i feel like it's going to be more like a c minus and a reliable cut once the format matures a little bit but for now let's start it at a c just kind of a, a fine middle of the road card we've got a new creature type up next shorekeeper shorekeeper is a single blue for a creature trilobite Yep, Trilobites are a uh, creature tribe in Magic now. It's a common, it's an 0-3, and for 7 and a blue, tap it and sacrifice it. You can draw 3 cards. I like this little guy. He's probably not good, but I like him. He's an 0-3, which can hold off the game for a couple of turns, but not many. And then, if you're flooding out in the late game, cash him in for 3 cards. Awesome hallmark of a great set right there. A card that has utility in the early game. And then, if you're flooding or just in the late game naturally, it also has utility. That's great card design. I'll start out playing him when I'm trying to be controlly in late game, but realistically, I think 03 is probably just too weak. So let's put him at a C- and tag on the warning, of course, that you don't play this if you're not planning to go late game. You don't play this if you're playing bears and pikers and flyers and planning to finish the game quickly. You play this when you're planning to go late game. Up next is Siren Lookout. Siren Lookout is two and a blue for a creature Siren Pirate at common. It's a 1-2 flyer. When Siren Outlook enters the battlefield, it explores. I'm getting the feeling that they're being a little bit cautious with explore, which I'm thankful for because Wizards has a history of maybe not doing plus one plus one counters great and maybe under costing too much. Anyways, it's a 1-2 flyer for three that draws a land, which is pretty unplayable in my mind. Or it's a 2-3 flyer that scries, which is fine i guess it's not something i'm scrambling to play because i really dislike half this card and the other half i'm just kind of all rightish on i'm going to start generally cutting this until i learn differently so i'm going to see minus on this it's just not impactful enough on either side i want the explore cards to be impactful on both sides and there are definitely some like the white first striker we saw yesterday but this one is not one up next is siren stormcaller siren stormcaller is a single blue mana for a creature siren pirate wizard Yep. At Uncommon, it's a 1-1 flyer. Pay a blue, sacrifice it, counter target spell or ability that targets you or a creature you control. This seems solid, like really solid. It's a 1-1 flyer, which I'm out on, you know, barring being in the favorable wins deck or something. But having an onboard counter to any removal or any burn or anything that targets you or a creature you control, that's pretty serious. This will demand removal of itself, which is kind of strange for a 1-1 flyer. I'm excited by this card and what it means for the format. I'm going to start pretty high on it at a B-. It's not removal or a bomb, but boy is it good. B- minus for Siren Stormcaller. Siren's Ruse is up next. Siren's Ruse is one and a blue for an instant at common. Exile target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If a pirate was exiled this way, draw a card. 
This is 100% deck dependent. I, I'd probably only begrudgingly play this card as a combat trick slash insurance, but if I have a cool ETB effect, or, or preferably several, I'd be a bit more happy to play this. And if they're on Pirates, bonus. I get to draw a card. Unfortunately, this is one of those cards that I really can't say too much about other than you need to know when to play it and when to not. Count up your ETBs. Are they cool? Then maybe play this card. If they're not, or you don't have many, then cut it. It's it's sort of a D plus, but it's a D plus that you'll sometimes just main deck. That's all there is to say about it, really. Up next is Spell Pierce. Spell Pierce is a single blue mana for an instant common counter target non creature spell unless its controller pays two generic mana. Making negate conditional does not make it playable, even for a one mana discount. Spell Pierce just is not a card that sees limited play. Far more meant for standard uh, uh, constructed. It's a reprint that people will be happy to see, etc. But for limited, it's just something that should sit in the sideboard and generally should not ever make it into your main board. So D minus for Spell Pierce. Spell Swindle is up next. Spell Swindle is three blue blue for an instant at rare. Counter target spell. Create X colorless treasure artifact tokens where X is that spell's converted mana cost. Yes, this is kind of mana drain, but mana drain was two mana. Mana drain for five mana, even if you get to spend that mana whenever you want, as opposed to needing to spend it the next turn, is a very different card. That being said, five mana hard counters have been playable in the past when they've done something else. Uh, we played Confirmed Suspicions in Innistrad, and it was generally fine. I actually kind of liked Contradict in uh, the Dragons format that it was in. I'll keep an eye on this. Uh, I think it'll probably be pretty darn good in a blue-black sort of control -y deck, which I think might exist here. And getting that mana, getting those treasures if they uh, have synergy for you are going to be really good. Do not expect this to just be mana drain. Three extra mana is a very, very different card. But I think it's still going to be pretty darn good. I'm going to put it in a C plus. Uh, it does not go into every deck. You need to be a specific deck for it. But I think the deck that wants it will be decently happy with it. Up next is Stormfleet Aerialist, which is a whole lot easier to say than River Wheel Aerialist. Uh, Stormfleet Aerialist is one in a blue for a creature human pirate at Uncommon. It's a 1-2 flyer. It's got raid. Stormfleet Aerialist enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it if you attacked with a creature this turn. This is not playable as a 1-2 for 2, again, barring fair, favorable, favorable wins, but as a 2-3 two, for 2, it's totally fine. I think this is basically only at home in the Blue Flyers deck where you're definitely going to be attacking uh, before you play this. If you're not aggro and preferably Flyers, this card probably should just be cut immediately. Uh, just a middle-of-the-road C for me. Up next is Stormfleet Spy. Stormfleet Spy is two and a blue for a creature human pirate at Uncommon. She's a 2-2. Two -two. She has a raid trigger when Stormfleet Spy enters the battlefield if you attacked with a creature this turn. Draw a card. This is awful if you don't get the trigger. It's just an overcosted bear. And we're getting bears with upsides regularly these days. But if you can get the trigger, which hopefully shouldn't be too hard, then this becomes fairly solid. That variability, unfortunately, is going to hurt this a little bit. I think I'll... Still just always play this, I think, unless I'm being in a very controlly, not attacky deck. But I don't think I'm going to pick a very highly, very, very, very middle of the pack to late in the pack. So let's go with like a C plus, but it's really lower than most C pluses. So a low C plus for Stormfleet Spy. Storm Sculptor is up next. Storm Sculptor is three and a blue for a creature merfolk wizard at common. It's a three, two. Storm Sculptor can't be blocked. When Storm Sculptor enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. This is a very high variance card. In some matches, it's dead. You literally can't play it. Or you, or you can, but it bounces itself. In other matches, you'll play it. You'll bounce something with a ridiculous ETB effect. Get that ETB effect again when you replay it. Plus, you have a 3-2 unblockable. While that ceiling is high, that ceiling is requiring multiple cards, multiple good cards, lots of mana, and time. The floor simply requires your opponent being an active participant in the game and keeping your board empty. As a result, I would tend towards the floor on this when I'm rating it, and I'm just going to give it a C. A natural 3-2 unblockable has some power for sure. But I'll keep an eye on this. Just be warned that it will occasionally play way better than it has any right doing, and it will sometimes just be a completely 
unplayable card in your hand. So C for Storm Sculptor for now anyways. Up next is Tempest Caller. Tempest Caller is two blue blue for a creature Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon. It's a 2-3. When Tempest Caller enters the battlefield, tap all creatures target opponent controls. Also, this thing doesn't fly. As much as it really, really looks like it has wings and is flying, it doesn't actually fly, which changes my rating slightly. This could just end games. I'd honestly far more consider this to just be a four mana sorcery spell you play at the end of the game. Sure, it's got a creature left behind, but ideally you're playing this to just win the game. Unlike that theoretical sorcery, you you do get the body left over behind it, which means that you can maybe, you know, get your opponent really low and then hopefully just finish them off with another extra creature or so. Uh, but realistically, this card is just going to end games left and right. It's going to feel so bad to have to play against this. It's going to be just like uh, River's Rebuke, except it costs two mana less. Uh, definitely a solid include in an attacky creaturey blue deck. Significantly less good and even just cuttable if you're being pretty controlly and light on your creature count. Uh, but still, in the average attacky style modern limited deck, I'd put this at a B minus. Our second last card is Water Trap Weaver. Water Trap Weaver is two and a blue for a creature Merfolk Wizard at common. It's a 2 2. When Water Trap Weaver enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. I honestly can't believe they still haven't named this mechanic. I really wonder what the holdup is on that. I'd love to say significantly fewer words. It freezes target creature or whatever anyways this is literally just frost links which was a very solid card except it has a relevant creature type attached to it uh always playable always totally welcome in blue uh it's a great tempo play if you're being aggressive it buys you time if you're being controlly just does everything i'd pick this relatively high in the mid pack and would consider it a b minus our final card for blue is Wind Strider. Wind Strider is four and a blue for a creature Merfolk Wizard at common. It's a 3-3 three, three with Flash and Flying. So five mana to give an Avon Reed Stalker one more point of damage. I guess that's worth it, but we've got Air Elemental in this set. This just feels too much mana for what it is to me, and I think I'd probably lean towards cutting this when I can. It's a solid sideboard option, though, if you're losing the Flyers, or it's probably just an include if you are a favorable wins deck, but it's still just so pricey. There's better options out there. As it is, I'm going to keep it at a C- minus for now. I'm probably going to cut it pretty regularly, I think, and only include it if I have a very good reason, such as being a Flyers deck or siding it in against Flyers. So that's going to wrap it up for all of the blue cards in Ixalan. Blue looks nice and controlly. I see playable counter spells. I see multiple playable bounce spells and grip tide. I see late game possibilities. I see a format that I think I'm going to enjoy. Let me know what you think of blue. Let me know what cards you're looking forward to, what cards you disagree with the ratings. Talk amongst yourselves down below, etc. As always, if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at TheManaLeak. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can also find me at Facebook.com slash TheManaLeak, Twitch.tv slash TheManaLeak, and Patreon.com slash TheManaLeak if you want to become a backer there, sponsor a draft, work your way towards earning a ManaLeak playmat, etc. If you like the content, click that thumbs up button. If you're new and you haven't already and you like the content and you want to see more, click subscribe. I do draft videos and cracker pack videos and uh, top 10 lists and live recaps of drafts, etc. All kinds of stuff. So make sure you do subscribe. And if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, though, let me know. Otherwise, see you all tomorrow for the Black Set Review.